good day or good evening. Welcome to the eighth episode of Creation, Genesis, and Origins. I'm Dick Fisher, and with me is my co-host, Ken Miller. Previously, we began to look at the biblical Adam as a historical figure. And we started with Egypt, where according to the Memphite theology, the theology of Memphis, Egypt, a created godlike individual called Atom served his creator God, and he was the father to nine others, including one named Seth. Some of the other offspring of Atom included Shu, Tefnut, Geb, Osiris, and Horus, all of whom play various roles in Egyptian mythology. If this Atom is an adaption of the biblical Adam, could it be possible these other characters were also adaptations of Adam's other sons or daughters that were mentioned but not named in Genesis 5-4? Actually, we might have had a chance to find out. The Jewish historian Josephus, writing in the first century, lived in Jerusalem and had access to the library that existed there until Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And ironically, he was an eyewitness to that. In his manuscripts, he gave credit to other historical writers, one of whom, apparently, bothered to list the names of Adam's immediate offspring. In his Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus discussed Adam, Abel, Cain, and Seth. He knew that Adam had several more children, but then he wrote, it would be tedious to name them. If he knew who they were and had he bothered to include their names, we might see other commonalities and know whether any of Adam's other sons or daughters were the source of these Egyptian demigods. That could have afforded us another valuable historical link. Alas, we'll have to be content with the tantalizing clues the Egyptians left us and not yearn for more. Leaving Egypt and returning to southern Mesopotamia, we have more historical evidence of Adam's existence and further confirmation of the important role he played during that time period. There is one historical personality, although encumbered with mythological embellishments, very well may have been Adam of the Bible, the legendary Adapa. There are a number of famous legends and epic tales that sprang from the fertile minds of Mesopotamian scribes. For example, there are the Twelve Tablets of Gilgamesh, Dumuzi and Anana, Zayasudra, Enmerkar and the Lord of Arata, tales of Enki, Enlil, and Marduk have been recovered. What Mesopotamian legends and epic tales have in common is that the subjects are either deities, male or female, or kings. We can assume that the public's interest was drawn to these two categories of characters almost to the exclusion of any other. And I say almost because of one notable exception. This man was neither god nor king, he was a priest living in Eridu, and his name as translated comes to us as Adapa. Several fragments of the legend of Adapa were taken from the library of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh. One also was found in the Egyptian archives of Amenophis III and IV of the 14th century BC. To date, six fragments of the Adapa legend have been discovered written in various Semitic languages. Versions and fragments of the Adapa myth have been found written in Akkadian, Canaanitish, Babylonian, Assyrian, and Amorite. Of note is that the legend was recorded in languages tied to tribes that are on different branches of Noah's family tree. Who would have been important enough so that descendants of both Ham and Shem would have written about him. Even a Sumerian version, similar to the Akkadian legend, was discovered in Tel Hadad in Syria. According to the legend, Ea, the god of wisdom, created Adapa, 
an exemplary man, endowed with superhuman wisdom, but not eternal life. A fishing accident angered Adapa, who broke the wing of the south wind and was summoned to heaven to appear before Father God, Anu. Ia had warned Adapa not to eat a certain food or drink any water that would be offered to him. A cautious Adapa shuns the food and water of life, whereby he would have acquired eternal life. And he is sent back to earth to live out his days. A fragment of one record of the Adapa legend rests in the Pierpont Morgan Library. Inscribed in Amorite, a Semitic language, this is part of the translation. In those days, in those years, the sage, the man of Iridu, Ia made him like a riddi, that perhaps could be rabbi, among men, a sage whose command no one could oppose, the mighty one, the Atrahasis of the Anunnaki, we might phrase that, exceeding wise even among the angels. Blameless, clean of hands, anointer, observer of laws. With the bakers he does the baking. With the bakers of Iridu he does the baking. This is part of the same legend translated from the Sumerian version. He made broad understanding perfect in him to disclose the design of the land. To him he gave wisdom, but did not give eternal life. At that time, in those years, he was a sage, son of Iridu. He does baking with the bakers of Iridu. He does the food and water of Iridu every day. Sets up the offerings table with his pure hands. Without him, no offering table is cleared away. With his pure hands, he sets up the offerings table at Iridu. Well, here is Iridu on the map. This is the picture of the tiny temple uncovered at Iridu that appeared in the Illustrated London News in 1946. There is the offerings table. And on top were found traces of burnt offerings. Pictured here is exactly what the legend describes. The Sumerian version of the legend of Adapa continues. Without a steering pole, he would take his boat out into the broad sea. South wind sent him to live with the fishes home. South wind, though you send your brothers against me, however many there are, I shall break your wing. This part comes from a version found in the Babylonian letters among the Amarna tablets in Egypt dated to the 14th century BC. As soon as he spoke, the south wind's wing broke. Seven days the south wind did not blow toward the land. Anu cried to his minister Elibrat, Why hasn't the south wind blown for seven days toward the land? His vizier Elibrat answered him, My lord, Adapa, the son of Enki, has broken south wind's wing. When, An when Anu heard this word, he cried, Heaven help him! rose up from his throne. Send for him to be brought here. And Ki, aware of heaven's ways, touched him and made him wear his hair unkempt, clothed him in mourning garb, gave him instructions. Adapa, you are to go before King Anne. You will go up to heaven, and when you go up to heaven, when you approach the gate of Anne, Demuzi and Gazeta will be standing in the gate of Anne will see you, will keep asking you questions. Young man, on whose behalf do you wear mourning garb? You must answer, two gods have vanished from our country, and that is why I am behaving like this. They will ask, who are the two gods that have vanished from the countryside? You will answer, they are Demuzi and Gazeta. They will look at each other and laugh a lot. We'll speak a word in your behalf to Anne. We'll present you to Anne in a good mood. When you stand before Anne, they will hold out for you the bread of death, so you must not eat. They will hold out for you the water of death, 
so you must not drink. Adapa carried out the instructions given to him by the wise Enki. Dumuzi and Gazita presented Adapa to the Father God Anne in a favorable light, and he was accepted. When Adapa drew near to the presence of King Anne, he saw him and shouted, Come here, Adapa. Why did you break South Wind's wing? Adapa answered Anne, My lord, I was catching fish in the middle of the sea for my lord Enki. But he inflated the sea into a storm, and the south wind blew and sank me. I was forced to take up residence in the fish's home. In my fury, I cursed south wind. Note here that a storm did not occur due to any natural phenomenon. It was commonly believed the weather and all the elements surrounding their lives, fertility, success in battle, all were under control of the gods. Anne's heart was appeased and he grew quiet. Why did Enki disclose to wretched mankind the ways of heaven and earth? Give them a heavy heart. It was he who did it. What can we do for him? Fetch him the bread of eternal life and let him eat. They fetched him the bread of eternal life, but he would not eat. They fetched him the water of eternal life, but he would not drink. They fetched him a garment, and he put it on himself. They fetched him oil, and he anointed himself. Anu watched him and laughed at him. Come, Adapa, why didn't you eat? Why didn't you drink? Didn't you want to be immortal? Alas, for downtrodden people. But Enki, my lord, told me you mustn't eat, you mustn't drink. Take him and send him back to his earth. To clarify in the Akkadian hierarchy of gods, we see Elu, the father god, in early manuscripts, which under pressure of the Sumerian An, who was their father god, came to be corrupted to Anu, seen in later Akkadian writings. Elu is the root of the Hebrew El, we see, for example, in Elohim, the word for God used in Genesis 1. And Ki, the creator god, god of wisdom adopted by the Sumerians, translates to Lord of the Earth. Known as Ea to the Akkadians, we see his name as Yahweh in Hebrew. He is the creator god in Genesis 2, and this name is used throughout the Old Testament. An and Enki in the Sumerian versions is Anu and Ea in the Akkadian. To summarize, Adam of the Bible and the legendary Adapa both are described as created humans by the creator god. According to the legend, Adapa was a sage, a profoundly wise man in Iridu. Adapa prepared the altar table. Daily, while Ea slept in his chamber, Adapa guarded the sanctuary. Regarded as prophet or seer, Adapa had been priest of the temple of Ea at Eridu. He was described as blameless, clean of hands, anointer, observer of laws. Could that also be descriptive of Adam, the first type of Christ? Also, Adam was taken from the ground in the Hebrew Adam from Adama. Well, how close phonetically is Adama to Adapa? Could it be only coincidence that Adam was told by the sweat of his face he would eat bread in Genesis 3.19, and Adapa was a baker by trade, or that Adapa was deprived of eternal life by not eating or drinking the food of water of life, while in Genesis 3.24, Adam was cut off from eating the fruit of the tree of life. In one version, Adapa was given vast understanding that he might give names to all concepts in the earth. And Adam was tasked to name the creatures of the earth in Genesis 2.19. Adapa was offered new garments, and in Genesis 3.21, Adam was clothed by God. Adapa was returned to the earth, and in Genesis 3.19, Adam was told he too would return to the earth. Ea was the creator god, but 
Anu was the father god in the Arcadian hierarchy of gods. When Anu summoned Adapa to appear, Ea warned him that two departed gods guarded the gate. These gods were Demuzi and Gazeta, two cult figures who mysteriously departed and became elevated to god status. Ea instructed Adapa how to get by the guards. He was soiled and sackcloth was put upon him. Ea explained what would be asked at the gate of Anu. O man, for whom art thou become like this? O Adapa, for whom art thou clad in sackcloth? Adapa was told to reply, In our land two gods have disappeared, and I have been brought to this plight. Finally, at the gate of heaven, Adapa was questioned. Who are the two gods who have disappeared in the land? Adapa feigned not knowing to whom he was speaking and replied, They are Tammuz and Gazeta. The two laughed. The ploy worked, and they gave him entry. When we discussed the Sumerian king list in a previous episode, we showed the fifth king who ruled at Tabira was Demuzi, who according to the legend disappeared and the women of the city wept and wailed for him. This cult following even was mentioned in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. Now he appears in the Adapa legend, guarding the gate to the Lord's house. In order to get on his good side, Adapa tells him how much he has missed here on earth. Well, this is just one example of someone named on the list of kings about whom there are legends, and he appears in different legends, and there is a continuity from legend to legend. The custom of donning sackcloth and ashes continued throughout Jewish history. In Ezekiel 4.3, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Yet this ritual was rooted in Akkadian lore and reflected in the Adapa legend. This is part of one Adapa fragment translated by James Pritchard. What ill he has brought upon mankind and the disease that he brought upon the bodies of men. It is not known what this is referring to in the legend. We can only guess. Although another translator attributes the disease to the south wind, rather than Adapa. It is apparent Adapa was an important figure to the Akkadians, the Babylonians, and the Assyrians. And there are numerous commonalities between the legend of Adapa and what we know about Adam from the Bible. Adapa is placed at Eridu, and Babylonian tradition places the Garden of Eden near Eridu and the four rivers described in Genesis 2, 10-14. Gods, goddesses, and kings hogged all the press. Adapa is the lone exception. As a descriptive term, exceeding wise, links both icons, Adapa and Zayasudra, worthy as legendary figures. Both Adapa and Adam are described as created by the respective gods. And if they are the same man in reality, and obviously the Creator is the same. There is broad appeal. The legend has been found in different locations in different languages. Adapa was a baker, and Adam was told he would eat bread. Adapa brought ill upon mankind, and through Adam, sin came into the world. Both Adapa and Adam had their conversations with their Creator. Both Adapa and Adam were accountable and answerable for their behavior. Both Adapa and Adam had access to eternal life and lost it. Adapa and Adam were clothed by God. Adapa was told to return to earth, and Adam told he would return to dust. Adapa gave names to all concepts in the earth, and Adam gave a name to every living creature, Genesis 2.19. Both Adapa and Adam are in the chain of ancestry to the Assyrians. Semitic Assyrian kings were well aware that Adapa was someone noteworthy. Sargon II, who reigned from 722 to 705 BC, 
likened him to a king with the likeness of the sage. Sennacherib, who was king of Assyria from 705 to 681 BC, said Ea gave Adapa vast intelligence. Sennacherib compared his own accomplishments in conceiving the ground plan of his palace and city with that of Adapa, who received his wisdom from his father, the wise Ea. King Ashurbanipal referred to Adapa, the sage. He recalled a dream where Asher, who founded Assyria and had achieved God status in the eyes of the Assyrians, spoke to him, saying, O king, lord of kings, offspring of the sage and Adapa, you surpass in knowledge even the Apsu and all the wise men. Although King Ashurbanipal may have been bragging a bit, nevertheless, he traced his ancestry through his grandfather back to Ashur and to Adapa. This puts Adapa in the chain of descent of the Assyrians, even at the apex, as Adapa, according to legend, had no earthly father. Cyrus of Persia established his reign from 559 to 530 BC. About the same time, Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon. His line of descent ran through Napapalazar, who was the father of Nebuchadnezzar in 2 Kings 24 to 26. Nebuchadnezzar too recalled the legendary Adapa. Lamenting on an idol he had fashioned, he added, not even the learned Adapa knows his name. Later in the same text, the Babylonian king told of a wisdom he possessed that greatly surpassed one which Adapa had composed. No other man so far back in ancient history had been given such accolades and by kings, no less, who couldn't possibly have known him except by reputation and through lines of ancestry. Translation of archaic names and places from Akkadian to English has inherent difficulties. Writing in 1906, Archibald Sace argued, the name Adapa should have been translated Adamu on the strength of the character Pa, which had the value of Mu a principle that governed the transcription of names and words was a selection of characters to express their sounds, which also harmonized with their sense. The last syllable of a name like Adamu was represented by an ideograph, which not only had the phonetic value of Mu, but also signified man, Sace recommended. Henceforward, therefore, we must transcribe the first name of the man of Babylonian tradition, not Adapa, but Adamu. Charles Horn, who published The Legend of Adapa in 1917, also included in a footnote Adapa, or perhaps Adamu. Reflecting for a moment on ancient naming patterns, often the name of an important ancestor was carried to subsequent generations. The second king on the Assyrian king list was called Adamu, after his far more famous namesake. In tablets recovered at Tello, Adamu was recorded among the proper names. Just as an Assyrian king was named Adamu, and the name cropped up often in Akkadian texts, from the reign of Sargon the Great. Adamu was found in records discovered at the Canaanite city of Ebla. One of the governors under Agris Halam, first Ebliite king, was Adamu. A vassal treaty of Asarhaddon, son of Sennacherib, carried a seal naming Asher, founder of Assyria, Genesis 10:11, as a god, and appropriately, Asarhaddon named his son, who was crown prince at the time, Ashurbanipal, in honor of him. Thus it should come as no surprise that Adamu appeared among the recorded names within Semite nations which were traceable directly to Noah's sons. In honoring their famous forefather, those tribes preserved the name for many generations, 
enabling us to identify this important family relationship. By contrast, the name Adamu cannot be found among those nations not related, the Sumerians, Egyptian, Persians, etc. One step further, when Akkadian words are carried into Hebrew, the nominative U at the end is dropped. Thus, Akkadian for Elu, for God, becomes El in Hebrew, meaning God. And in dropping the U in Akkadian Adamu becomes the Hebrew Adam. We think there is enough compelling evidence to cause us to believe that the author of Genesis and the original composer of the Adapa legend had in mind the same man. In the case of the biblical author, he likely felt compelled to tell his audience what was deemed important or relevant. Even the historian Josephus didn't tell us everything he knew, but I believe we can infer that there was a body of material that was commonly known upon which the composer of the Adapa legend could draw. There were certain facts that were incorporated. Adapa, dare I say, Adam, was a priest living in Eridu. He had a special relationship with his God. He was a baker and a fisherman. Something was known about his opportunity for eternal life. And he was important enough that a legend about him would be marketable. An intelligent, creative scribe with a good story could sell copies. Yet I believe the author of Genesis had a higher purpose. We know that by the time of Abraham, there was only one God. Why so many gods in Mesopotamia? With clear skies at night, the Sumerians took to stargazing and noted that seven wanderers behaved differently. Today we know planets orbit around the sun, but they thought gods were moving them around and there arose a belief in heavenly gods and lesser gods that governed many things that could not be otherwise explained. Gradually, a pantheon of over 3,000 gods arose. The Akkadians originally believed in a triad, Elu or Anu, Ea and Enlil. As these two cultures were in constant contact, the more culturally advanced Sumerians welcomed their Akkadian neighbors to the fourth and third millenniums BC. Besides learning how to write, they also adopted much of the Sumerian culture, including their gods. Sumerian gods such as Utu, the sun god, and Inanna, the goddess of the planet Venus, were known to the Akkadians as Shamash and Ishtar, for example. The Akkadians became polytheistic up to the Great Flood, which likely was one of the reasons for the flood, but a plurality of gods was always a problem for them, and also to the succeeding Israelites as they continued to rub shoulders with their other nations. In the next episode, we will look at the travels of Adam's sons. I want to thank Ken Miller for joining me, and thank you for watching. And I look forward to our next meeting.